I'm here to talk to you about wiretap coding and its connection to software obfuscation, which is something that's really exciting. It's been happening um, in our field over the last few years. And um, as I mentioned to some of you before, I would really love it if we had lots of questions. Please interrupt, please ask um, anything that's on your mind. You know, I'm used to speaking to cryptographers, so especially if I say something that doesn't make much sense, then please, please do stop me and, and um, I'd love to answer your questions. Okay, so um, all right. So before I get into the crypto aspect, let's just, you know recall our fun, beautiful, basic information theory stuff, right? So you know, back in 1975, Weiner introduced one of the most, you know, one of the simplest and really beautiful settings for uh, cryptography in an information theoretic setting, where the idea was that we have Alice um, who wants to communicate in a private way with Bob. And she has a channel, let's call it Bob's channel or channel Bob, right? That she can use to communicate with Bob. Unfortunately for her, whenever she communicates over channel Bob, it also gets sent to Eve, our eavesdropper Eve, over a different channel, over Eve's channel, okay? Which is some other separate channel, right? And um, we have a very basic task, right? Alice wants to be able to communicate to Bob without Eve learning what her message is, okay? And we're in a very simple setting. Uh, these are discrete memoryless channels, like the binary symmetric channel, things like that. Uh, and it's completely non-interactive. So Bob is not allowed to respond. There's no feedback in this situation. Um, and there's no shared secrets. So Alice and Bob have never met each other before. They just happen to have this channel over which Alice can communicate to Bob, okay? So again, it was introduced back in 1975. Um, I've put a formal definition here of security, but I think I'm just gonna skip over it. Let's just keep things you know, simple. If you guys want to ask, I'm happy to go back. Um, uh, also, I just wanna mention that we're gonna be talking about uh, these wiretap coding questions. And to keep things simple, we'll generally just think about a single bit that Alice wants to send to Bob, okay? Now, of course, generally we want to think about rate and you know, longer messages and all that. And in fact, we get optimal rate in a pretty simple and straightforward way. So it turns out that all of the interesting stuff that happens, happens already when you're just trying to transmit one bit, okay? All right, so um, yeah, so let's think about this. You know, when is this possible? When is it not possible? If you think about it for a moment, there's one case in which it's very clear that it won't be possible, okay? And that is if Bob's channel is a degradation of Eve's channel, right? If there is some other channel, channel S, and what Eve can do is just take whatever she gets from her channel and then pass it through another channel. And in this way, she's able to completely simulate what Bob's uh, you know, behavior is like, what he's able to see. Then of course it's impossible, right? There's no way that Bob can learn something that Eve doesn't because Eve can simulate Bob, right? Eve can just simulate Bob and then run whatever decoding algorithm he has, right? And by using the decoding algorithm, she'll be able to learn the secret, right? So that's clearly a fundamental limit, right? Um, cool, all right, so we have a fundamental limit that you know, we, we can only work uh, if uh, Bob's channel is not a degradation of Eve's channel, okay? Um, I think this was just observed like in the introduction of you know, Weiner's paper or something like that. I, I don't even know who, who observed it. It's so obvious and clear. Okay, so um, great. Now, what can we actually do? For example, is this, is, this, is, this, is this an if and only if? Can we actually hope to show that as long as this degradation condition does not hold, then there is a wiretap coding scheme? So as you can imagine, this question was asked in 1975. So you know we're far from the first to think about it. And in fact, just a few years later, uh, Cesar and Corner in 1978, show that actually the answer is no, that if you want an information theoretic wiretap coding scheme, then uh, in fact, there's another in fairly intuitive notion, which is a notion of less noisy. And what they show is that if Eve's channel is less noisy than Bob's channel, then there's no hope. There's no hope of this kind of wiretap coding, okay? And, um, and just to give a couple of, start with an example, okay? Suppose that 
Bob's channel is a binary symmetric channel, just a flip flip cut channel, okay, with probability p. Eve's channel is an erasure channel with some probability of erasure epsilon, okay. So if you think for a moment, you'll see that epsilon equals two p is when we are in the degradation setting, right? That basically um, Eve she gets something over an erasure channel, something gets erased. So if she wanted to simulate Bob, she could just flip a coin every time she gets an erase symbol and just replace it with the output of the coin, right? And that means she'll be able to simulate uh, Bob in those settings, okay? We don't care about those settings because of the degradation settings. So I'm just el eliminating that from my graph here. I'm graphing epsilon minus 2p versus p. So these are, these are all the cases which are not degradations, okay? However, it turns out that this is not all green. You know, it's not, you can't, you can't do wiretap coding everywhere here. And as a concrete example, you can think of a uh, binary symmetric channel with flip probability 0.1 and an erasure channel with probability, erasure probability 0.3, okay? And if you think about this and you remember, you know, your basic uh, coding theory stuff, then you'll see that un unfortunately, uh, it is the case that um, Eve's, sorry, that Eve's channel, um, which is the erasure channel, actually is less noisy than Bob's channel, because even a 0.1 flip probability is actually uh, pretty big in terms of entropy. And we can define this formally, and it was defined back, uh, why is this? Okay, let me just get rid of this, whatever this annoying message is. Okay, sorry. Um, right. So you know the definition of less noisy is, is is what you would expect. It just says that you know Eve's channel is less noisy than Bob's channel if the entropy of the message that Alice is sending, conditioned on Bob's information, is greater than the entropy of the message conditioned on Eve's information. Right. That means like. Bob is more unsure about the message. And in that situation, we're, we're out of luck, right? That's sort of what, what uh, Cesar and Corner approved back in 1978. And it makes sense, right? Sounds reasonable, sounds, you know, inter you know not, not, too, uh, not too weird. Um, and again, it was proven back in 1978, right? Well, um, that sucks though, right? Because, I mean, this is very enticing, right? stuff where things are impossible. You know, in cryptography, in general, we're in the business of doing impossible things, right? Like that's just what we do as cryptographers, right? In, as modern cryptographers, you know, we're not limited to just using information theory. We have these amazing powers of assuming that we get by assuming things like factoring is hard, right? Or, or other kinds of problems that we assume that they're computationally difficult. And we can do crazy impossible sounding things like zero knowledge proofs and public key and public key cryptography and all those sorts of things, right? So why should this present us with a barrier, right? Like we're used to eating these kind of things for breakfast, right? Um, so, I mean, before yeah. we go to the computational aspect, can I um, ask yeah. you about the uh, less noisy condition that you wrote in the other slide? Yes. Uh, is, it, is this equivalent to saying that for any input distribution on X, the mutual information between X and Y is uh, less than the mutual information between X and Z? Is that the equivalent? Yes, yes, those are just equivalent. I, I just happen to like it <laughs> better myself uh, this way. This is for some proof that we use, but, but yeah, it, we can it just as easily write it in terms of mutual information. Got it. Okay. Um, right, so again, can we do better in the computational setting? This is what people like me do for a living, right? Like we take these things that seem impossible and we, we try to attack it. All right, so let's take a stroll down memory lane, right? This is a very successful enterprise for us. So, you know, back in 1949, Shannon proved that unfortunately in an information theoretic setting, if you want to do secure communication and you have a shared key, then the key length has to be greater than the message length, right? We all learn this, we all learn about one time pads and things like that, right? So. That was sad, but you know, just a few years later, well, a few decades later back then, but in the 1970s, you know, we had uh, pseudorandomness, the theory of pseudorandomness that, that, that came into being. And in fact, it's really earlier than that. There were, there were proposals before that, but they were 
there were proofs that started to achieve that started to appear in the 1970s where it's okay as long as you're willing to make a computational hardness assumption then you can have a fixed key length and and still have unlimited message sizes and have security that's related to the length of the key right so that was a great you know great success uh, just as another example um, secure multi-party computation Maybe not all of you know what that is, but uh, at a super high level, it's the idea of having many mutually distrustful parties cooperating in order to compute some function on their private inputs. Okay, it's a really powerful <coughs> tool. Um, and in this case, it was actually essentially contemporaneous. Uh, in the information theoretic setting, uh, we need to assume that a majority of the parties are honest. And actually, for those of you who work in blockchain or have thought about blockchain things, some echoes of this show up in, um, in the blockchain world. Um, uh, but again, if you're willing to make computational assumptions, just the assumption of, of, of well, of something called oblivious transfer, but there, there's certain pretty simple um, computational assumptions that we can make, like factoring, for example, that factoring is hard. Um, and under that assumption, you only need one party to be honest. If you have n parties, n minus one of them can be dishonest. As long as one party is honest, we can at least maintain the privacy of that honest party. Okay, so again, just really remarkable things are possible. And you know, this is just just two examples. There are many, many, many more examples like this. But wiretap coding, you know, again introduced back in 1975, information theoretically characterized in 1978, but for the past 40 plus years, just no progress, nothing. We've never been able to attack this computationally, right? And that's weird. That's not a thing that we're used to in the world of cryptography. We're actually used to attacking these things, these powerful tools. And um, I can talk more about why, a sort of what, what was it about this problem? Um, let me do that a little bit. So essentially, the thing that makes this problem so challenging for us as cryptographers is its non-interactive nature, right? The fact that there's no feedback allowed at all. In a lot of cryptography, either secret, either shared keys, some sort of shared setup, or some kind of um, talking back and forth is really crucial to making use of the tools that we've had uh, over the last uh, several decades. But we just didn't have the, the right tool. Like a, that, you know, people have thought about it. Of course, you know, all of you have heard of Weiner's uh, wiretap model. It has some 7,000, 8,000 citations, some absurd. I mean, it's, it's a, many eyeballs have looked at this problem and yet somehow nothing happened. And what I want to show you, first of all, is today you're going to see, we're actually going to uh, finish this up and change the, the face of wiretap coding. Um, and I'll show you why, at least give you a little bit of an idea about like what, what was it that made that possible, okay? So um, in fact, what we get is just a completely, sorry. <laughs> what we get is uh, uh, just a completely tight result. So we can in fact show that wiretap coding exists if and only if Bob's channel is not a degradation of youth channel. That's it, just the simplest, trivial looking observation that we started to talk with. That's the only obstacle. It's the only obstruction towards building wiretap coding, which means even if, even if Eve's channel is less noisy than Bob's channel, even then we can do wiretap coding, right? Which again is surprising, right? It's not super obvious um, why that would be the case, okay? Um, and what's the tool? What's the thing that makes this work? It's program obfuscation, which is this new um, thing that's been happening in my field. And now I'll now segue to talk to you a little bit about program obfuscation. Okay. Are there any questions about this part? Just about the setup? Yeah. Well, what's the wiretap What is a wiretap coding scheme? Ah, okay, sorry. You're right. I never actually said that precisely. Um, so a wiretap coding scheme is what's on this slide. So it is a pair of algorithms, encode and decode. Encode will typically be probabilistic, uh, and decode can be deterministic, right? All doesn't have to be, you know, they could both be probabilistic, such that when 
uh, Alice encodes her message, Bob does successfully decode, but Eve cannot. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, so, uh, okay, it, the problem was this less noisy thing. So, um, uh, I, at a, at a, okay, so, uh, I'm sorry, you guys are all information terrorists. I, I don't mean to, you know, my brother's also an information terrorist. I don't mean to make fun of you guys, um, but, but, you know, in information theory, there's no magic, okay? You know, like, you have to actually have um, capacity, you know, like the channel has to actually have, <laughs> you know, the capacity to, you know, do what you want it to do, right? And there's unfortunately, no there's no way. Oh, if the if Eve's right. channel is just less noisy than Bob's channel, then like how are you going to do it? How are you going to send a message so that only Bob gets it but Eve doesn't, right? In the so, other I mean, case, if 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 it was the other case, then you can think about the kind of coding to the middle, right? You can kind of code to some gap in between them, and if you code to the gap, then you know Bob will still get enough information to be able to decode, but Eve will be missing a lot of information. Then you can do things like secret sharing to make sure that Eve gets nothing. Okay, so that's sort of why it works, and like the reason why it doesn't work is because essentially you can prove there's nothing else you can do. So Amit, to summarize, yeah. information theorists are plumbers, and you guys are ma magicians. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry. No, look, I love information theory. Of course, I love these information theory. No, there's nothing bad about uh, plumbers, by the way. I'm just <laughs> no, yeah, plumbers are great. I'm just making a statement, I'm just making a statement no to about. reflect your sentiment here. <laughs> right. Um, but does, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Very good. All right. So, uh, any other questions? Questions about just the wiretap mod like model? Yeah. And the, uh, the secrecy for right okay so yeah i'm sorry i just skipped over it um right so what is security right um again let's think about the simplest possible situation alice only wants to send a single bit just either zero or one okay and so security will say that if she picks a random bit and sends it across and let's say that bit is b then the address right here is eve right so eve on input what she gets from Eve's channels processing of the encoding of B, the probability of her outputting B is negligibly close to one half. So she basically does no better than, than random guessing. Okay. And by the way, this definition is not the original definition. This is a better definition, but it's okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. We assume that the channels are known in advance, that they're independent, all of those sorts of things we're just taking for granted, right? Yeah. Those are, of course, wonderful things to think about. Uh, um, but yeah, even for this basic setting, there was no progress for 40 years. Okay. Any other questions? All right. If there are no other questions, let me. Um, switch a little bit and tell you about what was the tool what's the tool that lets us do this okay and again that tool is called program obfuscation okay so before i tell you about that and this is really like completely separate now okay so switching modes um before i do that actually let me ask you to ponder with me the following disturbing scenario okay so suppose that you guys want to keep a secret okay but unfortunately for you, there's an adversary that has ripped out your brain from your skull, okay? Holds it, your brain in his hands, okay? And can read and tamper with every single neuron in your brain, okay? While keeping you alive somehow, while you are thinking about the secret that you wanna keep from him, okay? So of course, I hope this never happens to you. That would be really sad. Um, uh, Thankfully, it doesn't happen to humans very much. Uh, I haven't heard about it happening very, very much. But this is a crazily uh, difficult, uh, well, okay, it's, it's a very frightening scenario, but, but us putting aside fright and 
human, human emotions, think about it as a technical challenge, right? I'm asking you to keep a secret from an adversary that can see everything about what you're doing. In fact, it can probe you, it can make you, it can give you additional stimuli, it can reset you, it can do whatever it likes while you are thinking about the secret. I'm not even, you're not even allowed to say, no, 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 I'm not going to think about it. You have to think about it. And even then I want to keep it a secret. Okay, well, I want you to somehow be able to keep it a secret. Okay. So thankfully, this doesn't happen to human beings very often, right? Or at least <laughs> at all, hopefully, never happens to humans. But if you think about it, this happens to you know, poor computer programs all the time, right? So the, the CS analog of your brain is a computer program. And computer programs regularly get captured by adversaries. In fact, we often just sell the programs to the adversary who happen, happily buys it and examines it, right? So, um, so we want an answer to this question where we replace your brain with a computer program. And again, we're saying, can we keep a, pro a secret within a computer program with no trusted hardware, no interaction, just a single ordinary program with ordinary inputs, and ordinary outputs, and a completely public computer. The initial conditions of that computer are completely public. Nothing is kept from the adversary. He knows the entire program from beginning to end. He can debug the program. He can reset it. He can modify it, do whatever he likes. And yet still can we keep a secret within that program, okay? So this is the problem that we want to attack. This is the problem of, or this is the problem that we have been attacking, um, that I have been working on for more than two decades. Um, and uh, it's a really tricky problem, okay? So, you know, it, it turns out that uh, it, was, it was at least labeled as something called a one-way compiler uh, back in 1976 in the classic work of Diffie and Hellman on public key cryptography. But I think it's actually much longer. It goes back even further than that. I think that as soon as people figured out how to write computer programs, they started to think about, well, can I somehow keep my algorithm hidden? Like, can I somehow mess the code up in some way that will hide things? And it was called obfuscated code as a result. Um, but, uh, in, and I have a whole bunch of slides which I'm not showing you, but um, you can imagine this is a very practically motivated problem as well, right? Because people have secret algorithms, they have secret keys that they want to hide inside their operating systems and things like that, right? Um, but in practice, it has been a complete disaster. Uh, no obfuscation scheme that has ever been employed, uh, deployed in, in, in practice has survived for more than a week or two of adversarial attack. So, you know, um, this is not one of those cases where practice was ahead of theory, not at all. Practice was terrible. Theory was also terrible. We didn't know how to do it for many, many decades. Um, uh, let me talk a little bit about, a little bit more about this just to help you build some intuition. So we have to ask the question, what kind of programs even allow for secrets, right? So let me give you an example. Suppose I had a program that had built into it some constant S, but the program was just a simple comparison operator, right? So it just took the input, uh, checked if it was less than S, if so, output one, otherwise output zero, right? So clearly this program can't possibly hope to hide S, right? Because if I give you access to the program, you can just do binary search and figure out what S is, right? So one has to be very, very careful about thinking about what kind of programs and what kind of secrets can you hope to hide, okay? And a lot of work in this area actually went into thinking about this kind of question. Um, you know, for secrecy to be plausible, at least the the secret must be unlearnable from queries to the program, right? And that's already false for many, many interesting programs. So again, one has to be very careful in applying this, this, this idea. Still, there was some sort of idea, some sort of hope that maybe we could have a virtual black box. We could sort of convert a program into, a, yes? Nope. Again, I, I can't, right? I'm giving you the program. You have it in your hand. How can I bound the number of queries you make? I don't even have the program. You have it, right? So, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Sorry. Good. Yes. Um, I forgot the audience that I'm speaking to. <laughs> yes. So I'm sorry. Uh, I'm a computer scientist. I'm a theoretician, which means that I assume that the universe is polynomially bounded. So in particular, the adversary is also polynomially bounded. Um, but it, 
that's an unknown polynomial, right? It's not like it's n squared or n to the 10th, this is some arbitrarily large polynomial, okay? Um, and sometimes we'll think of that as being sub-exponential, but anyway, those things don't matter. As a general rule, yes, we are, I'm a computer scientist, I make these assumptions. And for example, if I'm assuming that factoring is hard, of course it's only hard if I don't give you forever, right? If you have as much time as you want, you can factor any number, right? There's no, nothing stops you from doing that. So yes, I'll just always assume that everyone is polynomially bounded, okay? But an unknown polynomial, okay, good. And yeah, so when I say unlearnable from queries, I mean unlearnable with a polynomial number of queries, okay? Thank you for asking that question. Um, very good. So yeah, so could we try to do this? Could we try to get a virtual black box out of, a, out of an obfuscated program? This was the hope. And then back in a paper we wrote with Boaz Barak and many other co-authors in 2001, we formalized this idea and then ruled it out. <laughs> so we gave a quick possibility result. And I'm not gonna go into the details of it, but one thing I will say is that the negative result we showed there is for extremely contrived programs. These are programs that we call self-eating programs. They're like a program which what you do is you chop it up into little pieces and then you feed it to itself, okay? And the program tries to see, am I eating myself? And if it's convinced that it is eating itself, then it just throws up its secret, just outputs a secret, right? So if you only have black box access to it, you have no hope of being able to feed it to itself because you only have it as a black box. Whereas if you have, if you have any obfuscated form of it, then you can feed it to itself, okay? That was just a high level explanation. I would expect anyone to fully understand what I just said, but that was the idea. Um, okay. Um, I, I wanna make a point, especially for this talk, that these negative results are, again, only known for these very pathological examples, okay? So um, as an initial heuristic for understanding what we can do with obfuscation, it's still very, very useful to think about things this way, just as a, as a, as a virtual black box. And again, a black box is something that you don't have access to, but you can talk to it, right? Okay, um, good. So- um, What's the technical term for this virtual black box? Uh, it's, it's just called virtual black box, VVV obfuscation, virtual black box obfuscation. I'm not writing down the formal definition there because of the fact that it is impossible in general, okay? I do wanna tell you about another definition that we came up with in the same 2001 paper. Um, uh, we thought it was a curiosity when we, when we first uh, thought of it. It was called indistinguishability obfuscation. Yes. Right. Yeah, that it's unlearnable. Yeah, Good. So, so you're, are you thinking what's like? So what, what other tools do you have to? Right. Okay. Good. 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 Let me. Okay. So. When I say that something is unlearnable with queries, I mean as a function, right? That I send over X, I get back F of X. And if I do this a polynomial number of times, I shouldn't be able to learn what F is, okay? But if I give you the code for X, if I give you the program for X, sorry, for F, if I give you the program for F, then you can just read the code and find what's going on inside, right? Let me give you an example. And, and remember, I'm a cryptographer, okay? So think about, an encryption function, right? Suppose that I have an encryption function with a, a fixed key, an encryption key, right? And I have the program, and in the beginning of the program is a constant key equals you know, some funny random string, right? And then it uses that to encrypt whatever you input to the, uh, to the function. Suppose it's randomized appropriately, okay? Now, if I only give you Oracle access to this function, if I only get, if I only, if you only just get to ask it for various ciphertexts, how will you learn the key? That better not be possible in fact, right? Like for a good encryption scheme, if I just get to query for ciphertext, 
you should not be able to learn the piece, right? So it is indeed unlearnable with queries. Are you with me? Okay. But on the other hand, if I give you the code, it starts with constant key equals, right? You just pick up, you just grab the key right out of the, right out of the, um, the code, right? And so what we're really asking is, is that possible? Can I give you the encryption function of a symmetric encryption system and then somehow obfuscate it to turn it into a public key crypto system? Is that possible? Is it possible to generically convert private key crypto into public key crypto in this way? And that's a tough question. Does that make sense? Okay, very good. Um, all right. Well, um, as I said, there's this, this intuitive definition and actually I'll mostly ask you to think about things intuitively in this way, okay, today. Um, but I, I have to share with you this excitement. Um, so there was another definition that we came up with called indistinguishability obfuscation, okay? And let me tell you what that is more precisely, okay? So IO is a compiler, right? So it's a probabilistic polynomial time uh, program. It can take as input some computer program, it outputs a computer program, okay? It should preserve functionality. So IO of P should be equivalent to P. And um, the size should only grow by some polynomial factor, okay? So it shouldn't blow up things too much. Yeah. So you're about time yeah, yeah uh, sorry. Uh, good. There we go. <laughs> so for today, you know, let's not worry about what programming language are you, we're using. Just imagine it's a Boolean circuit, right? So size is the same as running time. Okay. All right. Um, and then now here's the weird thing. What am, I, what am I going to ask as far as security? I'm going to make the following, perhaps not super intuitive uh, request from this definition, okay? So what does it say? <clears throat> it says, if you give me two programs, P0 and P1, that are exactly equivalent. So they actually both compute an identical function, okay? If I give you two such equivalent programs of the same size, so the same size of Boolean circuit, right? Then no adversary should be able to distinguish the obfuscation of P0 from the obfuscation of P1, okay? So let's think about that for a moment. Okay, sorry, I'm just, unless anyone really wants me to, I'm gonna skip this. Is, this is a formalization of this, okay? Um, and we write it uh, technically like this. We say that IO of P0 is computationally indistinguishable from IO of P1. Okay. And that again, just means that any polynomial time adversary can't tell the difference, can't see which one it came from, okay? All right, so how can we think about this guarantee? The first observation is that if there was a way of taking a Boolean circuit and producing a canonical form for it, that would satisfy this definition, right? Because both P0 and P1 would have the same canonical form and therefore would be indistinguishable from each other, right? Now, we do not believe that it is possible to come up with canonical forms for Boolean circuits. Like we just don't think that's true, right? So instead what we're asking for is a pseudo canonicalizer, something that is indistinguishable from a canonical form. So it only reveals as much as a canonical form would of that program, okay? So this is this notion of IO, it could also be called a pseudo canonical obfuscator or pseudo canonical compiler. Um, and it turns out that this notion has turned, has been incredibly successful as a tool. So, uh, back in 2013, uh, in some joint work with Brent Waters, we came up with a few techniques for using this tool. And since then, there've been well over a hundred papers using it to build various different kinds of cool, uh, cryptographic, uh, objectives, including things that have never been done before. Okay, um, and, uh, and there was a real explosion of excitement when, when that work happened and there's a, a lot of stuff going on. Now, of course, the other thing that makes it really exciting and, and the reason I'm giving you this talk in 2022 is that last year, uh, or actually late 2020, um, after a long series of work um, in a joint work with my PhD student, uh, Ayush Jain, 
and my longtime collaborator, Rachel Lin. Really awesome, awesome collaboration. Multiple years of collaboration. We were finally able to construct this object. So we now have an actual construction of indistinguishability obfuscation um, based on the hardness of decoding random linear codes over ZP, the hardness of an assumption over elliptic curves, which I won't specify, um, and the existence of low depth pseudorandom generators, which also have a long history in cryptography. Okay? So these three assumptions have, have long histories. Um, and this is the very first time that we've ever been able to actually have this object kind of in our hands in a provably secure way. Okay. Um, and okay, I'll, there's some prizes and stuff, but yeah, it, it, this, this is this is a very um, useful thing. Okay. So um, all right. In the yeah, question. So in the case of the Boolean circuit, there is uh, there can be a secret in the program like the secret bit or something. Right. So um, you know, you can actually take any program, whatever you like, in Python, right? And as long as you bound the running time, you can convert it into an equivalent Boolean circuit. This is just a standard transformation. It was actually the basis of Cook's theorem, for example. Um, one way to think about it is you can take the state of the program, sorry, the state of the computer over time, make a giant table, right? Every memory location, like memory locations and time, right? And then there's only some finite logic, right? That connects every step in time. Just put all those finite logics together and you get yourself a Boolean circuit. Is that good? Okay. Any other questions about this? All right. Um, very good. So uh, in the time that I have left, I wanna give you a sense of why this object is so useful and so powerful coming back to wiretap coding. Okay. I'm not going to say anything more about obfuscation. I could give many multiple hour long talks about it. I'm happy to answer questions though about that. Okay. Um, so if there are no questions, let's go in. Let's get into it. So um, I think it's easiest to start with this, just the simple example that we have, right? So, uh, and by the way, when do we normally finish? When is it? Usually at five. At five. Okay, good. All right, perfect. Plenty of time then. Um, so, uh, yeah, let's just take that simple example. We have a binary symmetric channel for Bob with flip probability 0.1 and erasure channel for Eve with uh, erasure probability 0.3. And again, unfortunately, that does mean that Eve's channel is less noisy than Bob's channel, okay? So again, information theoretically, this is impossible. There's none, no way to do this, okay? So how are we gonna do it? Now that we have our new hammer of obfuscation, right? Now I can, what, what does that mean? Alice can now send these encrypted programs to Bob, right? Eve will also get it. So both Bob and Eve will get this encrypted program, this obfuscated program. They can both run it, but now can we somehow make, take, an, take advantage of that, right? In order to, uh, now that we have this, this channel. Okay, so let's think about how we'll do that. The idea is extremely simple, okay? Very, very simple. So here, what are we doing? We pick a random, uh, vector r, this is a random bit string, okay? And I send it over to both Bob and Eve, right? So Bob receives r sub b, r sub b is like 10% bit flips of r, right? Otherwise, most people agree, agree with r. Eve, on the other hand, gets, let's say, r prime, or sorry, <laughs> okay, let's say re. Um, so re uh, contains, you know, 30% erasure, so 30% like bot symbol or something like that, right? Cool. Now, uh, how are we going to, uh, how are we gonna uh, make use of this? I'm curious, does anyone see? Well, what could we do here? Now, the thing, the thing that I'm giving you, the additional power that I'm giving you is that now, essentially, Alice can send a function to Bob and to Eve, right? So both, so Bob gets R sub B, Eve gets R sub E, but now East Alice can also just send a function, just send over a function that both Bob and Alice, uh, Bob and Eve are allowed to call that function using, you know, Bob is allowed to call it using R sub B, Eve is allowed to call it using R sub E, okay? And we want the result of that to be that Bob learns something while Eve does not learn anything. Yes? 
Yes. Indeed. Yes. Uh, good, good. The, what you just said, right, uh -huh. is why it is true that Bob's channel is not a degradation of Eve's channel, right? If Eve tries to do that, then she will end up with a BSC 0.15, right? So that's why it's not a degradation. However, if you just do the calculation, just do the entropy calculation, it's annoying to do, so I didn't do it on the slide, but just do it at home, you know, <laughs> and you'll verify that unfortunately, even 0.1 flips, because remember, Bob, even though only 10% of his bits got flipped, he doesn't know where they are, right? Whereas Eve knows exactly where the erasures are, right? As a result, Eve's channel is still um, significantly, I mean, you know, constantly less. Yeah, okay, good. But I'm glad you said that, though that'll come up in just a second, you know, just reminding us why it's not a, why it's not a degraded channel, okay? So since we do have a little bit of time, I'm curious, yeah, idea? Can we try and hand over the decoder and it's not gonna be useful for uh, Eve? Okay, excellent, excellent. I love this idea, right? So what you're saying is, why doesn't Alice send over a Bob decoder, right? send over some sort of decoder that works for 10% uh, bit flips. Is that what you're saying, right? Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, and, and maybe instead of sending a completely random R, he could pick R from some code, you know, as a code or from some large, you know, uh, uh, error correcting code um, and sort of share the decoder or something like that, right? So you're on the right track, right? The only tricky part is that Remember, we are assuming that Eve, even though she's computationally bounded, she has all the wisdom of all information theorists, you know? So if you pick, you know, some Reed Solomon code concatenated with some, some, some whatever, you know, your favorite code, she does know how to decode it, right? Because she has read all the information theory literature, right? So she knows how to decode those particular, you know, type, types of codes, right? But you're still, you're still like very, very uh, uh, close to the idea, right? Where the idea that you're trying to think of is, is there some function, right? That can somehow make use of things that look like RB, but can't make use of things that look like RE. Yes. So this is a really dumb comment, but, yeah. but can this program just like have the original R? Yes. And then there's a ticket, and then it counts with the H law of like what you input to it, right? If I put input RB, then it gets those RB with R and it sends the output. But if there's an eraser in there, it's just like output false. So like RE does not learn anything, then it will just output like uh, zero, zero eraser, zero zero. But RB can now learn anything. Excellent, excellent. Now all you guys just need to talk to each other now. <laughs> You're very close. Just, just So remember that Eve is an adversary, right? You can't instruct her only, only input RE, right? Eve is allowed to input whatever she wants into the, into, the, into the F, right? And as she said, her best bet is gonna get something with about 15% errors, right? So we need to make sure the F does not give anything useful when you give it something with 15% errors, but it does give something useful when you give it something with 10% errors, right? That's it, that's the solution. It's really simple, okay? So uh, that's what we'll do, right? I'll just make my function, which you guys came up with on the fly, which is great, right? Um, it has R built into it, right? It has, um, it has R built into it, and it just take, looks at the input, sees if it's you know, roughly 10% um, in terms of bit flips from, from R, right? If so, it just outputs, in fact, why even output R? Just output the message, output whatever it is that I wanted to send, right? Just whatever the mess secret message was, it outputs the secret message, right? On the other hand, if it's significantly different than 10%, then it just outputs five, right? And that's it, right? This is the power of obfuscation. Obfuscation is so, such a powerful tool because it intuitively just sends a send across functions. You know, 
again, Eve has this. Eve does have, she has access to this function, but she can't peer inside it, right? She can't actually find that M because it's obfuscated in, intuitively, okay? I'm just speaking intuitively right now, okay? And, um, you know, uh, exactly. Uh, our prime is an arbitrary input here. So this is a function, right? So every function has to have some input. We could have called it X, but my superscript R. Uh, what is this? Okay, yeah. Um, so this uh, is just the way that we typically write for meaning that this is a function that depends on R. Yes, right? The point is that um, this means there's, an, there's a constant R inside of F, okay? And it just compares R prime with R and decides what to do, okay? So this is very simple, extremely simple idea, right? And, uh, you know, and, and the security is just, is, is just what you were saying, right? It's just that, look, <laughs> Eve has 30% erasures. You know, what are the chances that she was gonna be able to find an R that only has 10% uh, flips in her polynomial time that she has, right? She only has polynomial time. There's an exponential space of possible, uh, you know, R primes. And she's just, she's, if she guesses at random, it's extremely unlikely to find it, okay? And um, yeah, and, 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 and that's it. That's this, that's this example, okay? Amit, can I ask a question? Yeah. I got a little bit lost here. Um, okay. So when you say send across an obfuscation of FR, the sending across is that you would have to go through channel B and channel E, right? This obfuscation. Good, good, good. Sorry, I, I, you're absolutely right. And I, I skipped that in my exuberance. Um, when I say that Alice sends an obfuscation of F sub R, I mean, she codes it to Bob's channel. Okay, so she just sends it using any nice, error correcting code, you know, your favorite one, just use the polar code, sends it over, whatever, whatever you like, right? And it's fine that Eve's, Eve's channel is um, less noisy. That means Eve will also get it, but that's okay. We're assuming that Eve gets it, right? I see, I see. So this is not a right faithful result in some sense, right? It's a- Good, 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 right. It's okay. So I know like, you know, uh, it's, we're plumbers, remember? We're, we're yeah, yeah, plumbers. plumbers, right? So yeah, so what's the rate, right? This like, it seems, seems horrible. So that's, again, there's no problem, all right? So what do we do? Instead of just sending a single bit, first of all, of course, this message can be longer than a bit. There's nothing special about a bit. So indeed, what we can do is we can use this construction to send over, uh, okay, I guess you can see me here. <laughs> um, we can use this construction to send over a secret key. Okay, and now at the end of this, Alice and, and Bob share a secret key. And then you can use, you can just, uh, you can use a rate one uh, encryption scheme using the, using the secret key. And again, just code it to Bob's channel. And this way we'll achieve actually the capacity of Bob. So this, this is actually optimal rate. And it's actually better rate than, than CK because we're using this assumption, right? So we're actually able to code to Bob's capacity. Does that make sense? I see. Interesting. Yeah. Asymptotically, of course. Yes. So, right? so remember, it's obfuscated, right? So that means that uh, intuitively for right now, I haven't talked to you about how we can do this with IO. Yeah. Indeed. Indeed, yes. So I should have, yeah, this, I really should have written constant R and M. Yeah. So right now, I want to pretend that we have a virtual black box obfuscation. So what that means is that what they can do is they can simply send our primes to this F and receive back either R or, or, uh, or sorry, either M or bot. Does that make sense? Good, yes. So is, is this program FR, uh, is it the decoder for BSC like uh, you were suggesting or is it? 
No, no, no. It's, 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 I mean, I, I think he got us started, right, down the road that, that led to the, the solution. But I want to emphasize that for this case, at least, for the BSC BEC case, it's really the, the thing that was missing for 40 years was obfuscation. Right, which well, is the fact that this is, this, is, this is a thing that you can do, right? That you can actually just send over functions. And once we have it, then a smart group of people, you know, we can just figure it out together in a, in a, in a few minutes, right? Like, my question was okay. like saying earlier, like what kind of functions can be obfuscated is a good question. So uh, is this function that we want to send suitable to be obfuscated? Very good, yes. So, um, so that's a little more com complicated. And since I'm running out of time, um, I will mention that uh, in the paper that I'm presenting right now, um, excuse me, um, we make an argument that this, this, is, this is what's called a statistically evasive function, okay? Meaning that, you know, basically it just outputs bot, right? Like almost always just outputs bot, right? Like it's, it's extremely hard to find any input on which it doesn't output bot, right? And in fact, that's statistically true. Like, you know, even given R sub B or R sub, or sorry, even given R sub E, it's statistically hard to find an input on which it outputs a non-bot, okay? So that's an example of a, of a class of functions for which we have no impossibility results. So that's one basic, basic point, okay? Now, in an unpublished follow-up work, <laughs> um, which yeah probably shouldn't shouldn't be talking about but anyway we 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 <laughs> we, we, we actually can uh, get this to work with just io with the with the thing that we actually know how to build so we can make this approach work assuming only indistinguishability obfuscation and um yeah but we'll we will post that soon and and uh, and um, and that will hopefully make it more clear um how that works it's a little more involved though technically it's not this was uh, hopefully I hope, I mean, not, I don't have to hope. Apparently this is simple enough that you all were able to just figure it out with me, right? Um, the IO thing is more complicated. There's sort of many steps that we have to go through to make that work. Okay, any other questions about this? Yeah, yeah, something, something like, um, you know, let's say it's an N bit string, then we'll look for something like, you know, uh, 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 point one n uh, plus minus n to the three fourths, something like that, right? That will be overwhelming probability and uh, and, and and good enough for us, and extraordinarily unlikely for Eve, yeah, to be able to guess that. Okay. Um, all right. Well, I have three minutes left, but I think, you know what, I will just, um, I will just skip over the general case. We, we, can, we can prove this for the general case. It's, it's a little more involved, um, but, uh, but not too much more. Um, there are a few different arguments we have to go through. Uh, sorry. <laughs> um, but, uh, but yeah, that, uh, that, that pretty much uh, uh, concludes the talk. So, you know, there's a very powerful tool program obfuscation. Um, it can be used to, uh, to change the face of our understanding of what is possible and what's not possible. And today, I just wanted to give you the example of wiretap coding. All right. Are there any more questions? Yes. So is this like the lack of understanding I currently have about Suppose you have a Boolean function which is bad determinant, and then suppose you don't even have a, a pseudo canonicalizer, but you have an extra canonicalizer. Okay. So like I, I have it like canonicalized. Yes. How does this canonicalized version actually affect the secret? Like, doesn't the canonicalized version have to reveal the secret itself? It's a, it's a wonderful question, right? And, and let me just give you a little bit of a history. So, when we came up with this idea, IO, um, back in 2001, you know, it was one of those, uh, as scientists, you can all hopefully appreciate what I'm about to say, which is that, you know, we had a negative result. It was pretty bad, like a pretty bad impossibility result. And we just wanted to find where are the holes, like what, what, how can we sneak through? Like what is, what is possible, right? 
and inspired by other definitions of cryptography, we just came up with this, right? But we observed that it's a pseudo canonicalizer. And so, you know, it was not at all obvious that this could hide anything. And in fact, for a decade, it was never used because no one knew what to do with it. Um, the answer to your question about why it actually does hide things is a little technical. Um, actually, it's pretty technical. <laughs> um, um, okay, I'm gonna try to set up something. Maybe it'll make sense, maybe it won't, okay? So um, you all know what a PRG is, a pseudorandom generator, right? So observe that the, uh, the image of a pseudorandom generator is sparse in its codomain, right? But it's a pseudorandom generator. So even though it's extremely sparse, you can't tell, right, whether you're in the image or in the code or in the entire code, right? So suppose I had a function which had built into it as a constant PRG of X, where X was chosen at random. Okay. And then the only uh, can I write something somewhere? Um, okay. All right. Can everyone see in this tiny little thing here? Um, oh, bigger whiteboard. That's that's better. Okay. All right. Yes. So, um, all right. Let's just use R as the R prime as the input. Okay. And again, I have Y equals PRG of X. Okay. Where X is some fixed input, y is something we've computed, and I'm writing the code of f of r, okay? So I have as a constant um, y, and I write if prg of r prime equals y, then, I don't know, output one, else output zero, okay, right? So what is this function? What does it do? Assume the PRG is one to one. Let's say this is a one to one. Sure, sure, no, I, I'm just asking you like, what is this function? Like if I, like, what is the function F? Or pass x as an input, right? Yeah, you're right. Like th this is equivalent, right? This is equivalent to yeah, you know, one if and only if r prime equals x, right? That's what this function does, right? Okay. So um, now I claim that I can prove to you that a pseudo canonicalizer applied to this function will actually hide. <laughs> will actually hide, um, uh, hide x, okay? How can I prove that? No, no, no. it's a, an efficient pseudo canonicalizer, just, just to be clear, okay? If your canonical form is allowed to take exponential time, then I have no, no argument. But as long as your pseudo canonicalizer is efficient, then I can prove to you that it'll hide x, okay? Why is that? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm just saying like, it's equivalent to this one, right? This fun this program does not hide X at all, right? It just has X right in built into it. You're right that X is nowhere to, to be seen in this particular code, but maybe a pseudo canonicalizer would in indeed hide it, right? But I can prove to you that it won't. And, and, the re and the argument is very simple that here, Y was chosen from the output of the PRG. If instead, so let's say I change to having y just chosen uniformly at random from, I don't know, let's say, let's say the PRG is from zero, one to the two n. So PRG right? If I change to this, now what does this function do? With overwhelming probability, what does the function do? Just always up at zero. 
right? But the fact that I can, using the security of the PRG, I can switch Y from something that makes it this function to another function that just always happens zero, that proves that in fact it must hide X, right? So these kinds of tricks, <laughs> this is something we called punctured programming. So this was introduced again, this work with uh, Brent Waters back in 2013. Um, it turns out that you can have many, many stages of arguments, which is called hybrid arguments, where we keep changing little things, little, little, little things one at a time and prove in this way that eventually we'll hide everything. But it's non-trivial. Sure. Any other questions? Yeah. Can you give a, like a sketch of how you analyze the results from uh, two arbitrary channels? Two arbitrary channels? Um, yeah. Um, uh, it's not it's, it's not all that complicated. Let me let me just tell you the 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 scheme and then uh, one second here it, it's here but um, okay. So if we have two two general channels and we know that Bob is not a degradation of E, right? What our function will do is instead of just checking you know ten percent, what it'll do is let's check every pair of symbols, right? For every um, for every uh, symbol X in Bob's received alphabet and every symbol Y, uh, okay, sorry, no, no. For every symbol X in Alice's alphabet and for every symbol Y in Bob's alphabet, right? It'll just check so it's statistics. It'll, it'll just check like approximately what, you know, am I getting the right fraction that I want, that I expect to get? Okay. And that's it, just does it for every one of them. If they all work out, then it outputs M, otherwise it doesn't, okay? So how do we prove that that's good? Um, it's, so it's a little, little involved, but it's, but it's pretty, pretty intuitive. The idea is that, first of all, you know, if, um, you know, if, if Eve was just a channel, like if all she did was just take whatever she got and run it through another channel, then, one can, one can show in a, in a pretty simple um, linear algebra that in fact, then there will always be some character that she'll mess up on. That if she, can't if she, can, if she can actually get the right statistics for, statistics for every single pair, then she can actually just go ahead and, 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 and simulate Bob. Yeah. Uh, good point. Yes. So right now we're only considering uh, classic discrete memoryless channels, right? Where it's just symbol by symbol. Um, those are good questions. We haven't thought about it. Um, I'm pretty optimistic that it should work, but I don't. I don't know exactly <laughs> how that would work. Um, but yes, these are just symbol by symbol channels. So so this is something that we can prove just in some simple linear algebra. Um, and then of course the problem is that Eve doesn't have to do that, right? Eve can use some arbitrary strategy. So the idea is here, we just exploit symmetry. We exploit a lot of symmetry in, in the way that our function is, is derived to basically turn what an arbitrary strategy of, of Eve uh, into a channel. And in this way, we sort of, uh, we reduce to the, to the case that we already have covered by the non-degradation condition. That's a high level sketch. Makes sense, okay. It's, it's more like this, we, we, we intuitively think she might as well use a channel, like there's nothing better for her to do. She might as well just have a, a stochastic you know, uh, matrix that she applies to each, each symbol one at, one at a time. And then we prove that using symmetry, just by showing that like, if she does something else, we can imagine some other Eve that actually behaves in a more symmetric way and achieves that, you know, at least, at least achieves a polynomial advantage or, uh, at least, she loses at most a, a polynomial factor in her, in her advantage over the previous Eve. And this way we sort of reduce to these different Eves until finally we just have a channel and that channel we know is, is, is not gonna work. All right, any other questions? Thank you. Cool, all right, thank you.